I'm uh, going to make it a little tougher this time than I did last time. <laughs> the phenomenon I'm talking about now is the theory of the electricity, light, and so forth. And we're concentrating on first tonight light, and next time, next Tuesday, it'll be about electricity. And uh, finally, we're putting, we're, and the two of them together. And uh, the next lecture after that, we'll talk about what's wrong with the theory and why, what's the rest, what's in the world besides electricity and light, what else there is in physics, and what new questions are up. But in the meantime, I'd like to talk about light. Newton started by many experiments and observations which began this subject. He found uh, there are phenomena that are so very, very common, but are absolutely sensational, ununderstandable, and almost impossible, supposing that light is made out of corpuscles or particles. Newton assumed that light was made out of corpuscles or particles because he made a mistake in reasoning. He said that he thought that the shadow edges were very sharp and that that meant that it must be particles because if it were waves that went past the shadow, they would spread into the shadow. This is a misunderstanding of exactly how waves do in fact behave. They do spread a little tiny bit into the shadow and the shadow spreads into the light of it, uh, but not very seriously, and in fact, the wave theory of light was, uh, is much easier, finds the phenomena that Newton discovered much easier to explain. But I want to start by taking the view that light is corpuscular, that Newton had, and remind you of what this phenomena are, and then go back over Newton's attempt to explain them and see how pitiful it is. So, uh, we start with that reflection of light from a surface of glass. I, last time I used water and I said it was 2% reflecting and somewhere along the line I changed it to one quarter and that was a mistake. It's glass that's a quarter and light water that's a 50th. 2% is not a quarter. I mean 1 25th. 2% <laughs> is 1 50th and for glass it's 4% or 1 25th. So we'll talk about glass. The first feature is, that's interesting, is that from glass, the light is reflected only partially, and if it's particles, it means some of them have come back, one out of 25, and some go forward, uh, 24 out of 20, 25. Uh, there's nothing hard, too hard about that. If you would suppose something is different from one particle to the other, even in their arrangement or something like that, but Further experiments have all shown that all light photons are exactly the same and in the same condition, and there's nothing we can do to preset the photon to make it more likely to come back from the surface, a single surface of water, than to go forward. There's no way. And we have, uh, well, I'll keep on going from the simpler point of view, and we'll discuss other models in a minute. But the really interesting feature is that the reflection of light from a glass surface is affected if there's another glass surface below it. For example, if you have a soap bubble, which is two water, the surface between air and water and water and air, then the two layers make colors in the bubble, which aren't in the water, but is produced by the effect of the reflection from the two surfaces. And if I choose light of a particular color, say if I looked at the bubble with purely yellow light, then I would see rings or areas that are black and areas that are bright yellow relatively. In other words, areas that reflect well and areas that do not reflect at all. In other words, the reflection from a surface, which you would expect from a single surface, can be reduced to zero by putting another surface here, which common sense would imply would increase the reflection, when it could in fact make the total reflection zero. And the actual reflection probability, chance that the photon or corpuscle gets reflected, varies with the thickness of the layer this way. If the thickness of the layer is zero, it doesn't get reflected at all. That's nice. No glass, no reflection. If the glass gets thicker, the reflection increases to a certain peak. 
And but if the glass is still thicker, the reflection falls again to zero, as I said, and rises and falls and so forth in a repetitious fashion. Now Newton, believe it or not, and then only working with very thin layers first, discovered this for three or four at uh, ten repetitions, and then was able by a clever experiment to demonstrate that it happened with after 34,458 reflections, uh, uh, repetitions. In other words, with a quarter of an inch of thickness, this bumpy thing kept, was still going. Nowadays, we can do this experiment in which these two things, these two reflections are separated by so far, a meter or more, and if the conditions are just right, uh, you get the monochromatic light of exactly one color from a laser, you can still see as you move this thing, reflection strong weak, strong weak, strong weak from the two surfaces. So it goes on forever. Now, how can we explain such a thing from the point of view of corpuscles? I do this to show you what a fix Newton was in to explain it because he thought it must be pulpit. First, the reflection must depend on both surfaces because it depends on the distance between them. Exactly. Yeah. Well, the wet one or the other surface that changes the reflection. So they're both involved. Yet it can't be that the particles are reflected from the first surface because if it were reflected from the first surface, it would never know where the second surface is and that reflection depends upon the position of the second first surface. For example, if it was reflected from the first surface, how could it be not reflected at all if there's a second surface at just the right distance. And therefore, it must be re entirely reflective on the second surface. But the reflection from the second surface is affected by the position of the first one. And therefore, it must be as follows. The first one generates an influence which, <laughs> which follows the generates some kind of a wave and a medium or something of a kind that follows the particle along and changes its disposition to be reflected or not reflected. That is, it gets the particle of, of light as it comes through can be in different conditions, either a condition of easy reflection or easy transmission, the opposite, no reflection. And whether it's easy reflection or easy transmission, is determined by some kind of an influence which propagates along from the front surface and overtakes the light particle and adjusts it, so to speak, to make sure which way it's going. Now, this uh, had a lot of difficulties with it. <laughs> it was called a theory of fits of reflection and transmission. It's not good for the following reason. You can't get along very well with the idea that it's not reflected at all from the front surface. Because suppose you had very deep water, just a little dirt in it, then you still see the reflection just as well. And if it's not reflecting the first surface, it's impossible to explain. Because that stuff which is coming, looking for the bottom surface, never gets there. And yet some light is reflected. Second, if it's all the decision about reflection is made at the second surface, then it should not be expected that it would be possible to alter that decision by putting in a third surface. Uh, Newton did not have available the experiment in which to do more than two surfaces. But had he done that, he would have found that the amount of reflection is altered again by the presence of third and fourth surfaces. And even though with two surfaces one might get a, hundred, a very strong reflection, by putting more surfaces underneath, you can reduce that again to zero. So that the decision is not being made on the second surface. The decision is made on the last surface, then how does it know as it's going along whether there's going to be a last surface or not? <laughs> now, uh, Newton, uh, is a, which I would say is a genius about something. Actually, he's a teacher of something. He's the man who taught us how to do or how to think about science in a modern way so that we can make some progress. He's the one who distinguished very carefully between the facts that he would develop and experimentally determine this really happened. That is to say, what really happens is that the amount of light for brightness does go up and down depending on the thickness. And that is to be distinguished from a theory to explain why it's so. He hasn't got a satisfactory theory. He did his best. I'm sure I can tell from reading it that in the back of his mind he knows there's something the matter with him. He knows the explanation is going to get him into trouble for somewhere. He can feel it. 
because he puts that part in the form of queries or questions of how does it work? Can it not be that there's a part, uh, influence which propagates along and overtakes the light and so forth? He doesn't say there is. This is going to get into difficulty. Now you're all happily laughing at poor Newton, but you have to laugh at yourself because you live in the world and this happens and you have these very good ideas about how things happen and you can't figure out how such a thing can happen from common sense ideas. Save one possibility. It's not particles. All right? And so it turned out that uh, people proposed that instead light is waves which come down and like the waves in the sea and parts of them bounce back here and they bounce back here and the crests come together under some circumstances of timing and the crest or troughs come together under other circumstances and you get strong or weak waves going out and that's what you, the, what you, you see in brightness is the strength of waves. So that for many years it was all these wonderful phenomena were happily explained by the wave theory of light. And the difficulty there, the idea there was that if you had a very dim light, the wave, that would represent very, waves hardly moving at all. There's a little motion carrying very little energy. So when they went to investigate dim light with the most sensitive instruments to see what it looked like, you found that the dim light would make an instrument like a photomultiplier or any other device that was very sensitive go off, said there's a certain amount of energy here. Now there's nothing, nothing, nothing. There's a bump of energy. The energy came in lumps. It wasn't a tiny little bit dribbling in all the time. And so the experiments with photomultipliers, which I unfortunately don't have a direct experience with, but the characteristics of them are that light is made like a corpuscle, so that although Newton's logic as to why they have to be corpuscles was wrong, it turned out he was right about there having to be corpuscles. And his paroxysms of reasoning that were produced by this thing, the torture of the mind that's produced by this phenomena, plus the fact that light is corpuscle, is, uh, had, was returned to the physicist as a real problem. And it has never been solved in a completely, well, solved in a way, in a description method by which we can predict what happens here. What happens here is that this is not the intensity of a wave, that is the amount of wiggling of the wave of some kind, but it's instead the chance that a particle comes as being counted by a photomultiplier. When I have the thickness so big, so and so many particles come down, if I sent a light so weak there was only one particle. I send only one corpuscle, one particle of energy, one photon to the system. And sometimes it bounces back, and sometimes it goes forward, and this gives you the odds that it bounces back and goes forward. For a single layer, the odds would be 4%. This maximum height here is 8%, and 4% uh, around here, and it can go down to zero. Now, it's imp we have not been able to find any system of logic that's consonant with ordinary ideas of causality and some, you know, ordinary ideas about what thing, things go. How can it not know when it's at the front surface, it's in the back surface, all that stuff that'll explain this or describe this. And so in order to keep going, in order to describe nature, we've had to generate a set of ideas which are empty of uh, a set of rules, rather, which describe how to figure out these probabilities, which are empty of models. That is to say, empty of a model of the type you're expecting. A particle is like a billiard ball that bounces against a wall and so forth. It doesn't work. Or that it's like waves. And what I would describe last time to you was this picture. Uh, I would say that it was in about the beginning of the 1900s that it was discovered that light is a matter of fact behave like particles, which was a terrible shock after the great success of the wave theory. And then the problem of trying to see how particles could make these wave-like phenomena that are so easily explained by waves became known as the wave-particle duality. If things would be said like light behaves on part as particles on Thursdays and on waves on Tuesdays. And that, of course, is not a satisfactory theory. The quantum mechanical, it turned out as a quantum mechanical theory, that he showed that light is not unique in this connection, that things that were supposed to be honest, proper particles, like electrons, behave sometimes, produced effects like this, exactly analogous. So 
things that start out as waves behave, behave like particles, and things that start out as particles behave like waves, until both, it was clear, behave the same way. They behaved in their own inimitable quantum mechanical way. It worked out in 1926. At first, the equations were discovered, and then it was, in fact, a man you don't hear of very much when they talk about quantum mechanics, a man named Born, who proposed Somebody's blowing their nose. In. <laughs> Max Born, who proposed the interpretation of the equation in terms of this idea that we're calculating probabilities of events, that it's a statistical matter, and that it's not possible to uh, predict exactly what will happen in a given experiment. Now, I want to repeat uh, the rule that we have here, which looks completely artificial. And I prepared you last time if you all knew. <laughs> he had a similar difficulty last time. Heavy, I'll take it out, okay? <laughs> right? Is it right? Okay. Now, I predict that the probability that I'll have a microphone of that kind next time is very low. <laughs> All right. Now, what are the, how do we describe this in modern physics? First, that we cannot predict what will happen. We can't tell you for a given particle whether it's going to be reflected or not. Horrors of horrors, but it's true. We give up. And second, in order to find it, the only thing we do calculate is the probability, let's say in this example, that it'll be reflected. More accurately, I should say better this way, that if you have a source of light here and a photomultiplier here to look, the probability that the photomultiplier goes off. That's what I'm calculating. I should have, I said, the probability that a photon went down and bounced back, that's bad. Otherwise, they get back in the old problem again. Which surface did it bounce from? No, no. Just the probability that the photomultiplier goes off. All right? Now, how do you find the probability that the photomultiplier goes off? As follows. General, not only about light, the whole of the world is built this way, according to these modern physicists. It's just an example. Photomultiplying go off, electron counter goes off, things like that. Probability, you calculate probability of events this way. The probability of an event that comes out in the end is proportional to the size of a circle <laughs> made by an arrow on a plane, a calculating plane over here. It's got nothing to do with the geometry of that. This arrow on the plane is called the amplitude, sometimes called the probability amplitude for the event. So everything that you want to count, like the chance that the counter goes off, has a probability. No, it has a probability amplitude. There's an amplitude that it goes off. The square of that, then it's the area, or proportional to the area. Somebody bothered me about a fact of pi last time. Correctly, correctly, uh, is the measure of the chance that the counter goes off. All right. Now, the theory, that's the framework of nature. And the rest of the theory of nature is to compute these probabilities, amplitudes, that is to tell the rule for finding the length of the arrow and where it's located. And that's what we talked about last time again. And I'm reminding you, in this particular case, it works as follows. For a light that's monochromatic of a single color, let's say red, it's the following is the rule. That... Uh, you draw, you draw an arrow for the reflection. Let's say, for instance, that this is, ref, say, a single surface. Reflects, let me suppose, 4%. That is, in fact, 1 25th of the light. So if a unit of light, if the light, one unit of probability is represented by that and its size circle, when light is reflected, the length of the amplitude arrow is 1 5th because its square is 125. So here's the amplitude arrow for reflection from the front surface. Should be 150, the other one. 
Incidentally, the same manner the reflection from the back surface produces an amplitude arrow for, re this is the amplitude rule one-fifth. That's the rule for reflection. And this, from the one top surface, this is the corresponding rule from the bottom surface, is to make the one-fifth in the opposite direction. And finally, one more rule, that you have to figure the time to go from the source all the way back to the photomultiplier, if it was going at the speed of light, and the proportional to that time, you move this around like a clock. So the effect of the reflection from the first surface is in fact an amplitude which is one-fifth long, but is tilted at an angle, which is what would result from a very rapidly moving, rotating clock hand going along as, if you wish, for the length of time that you would calculate ordinarily for the light to come to the first surface and bounce back. It goes around like a son of a gun. Fifth, one followed by 15 zeros a second. Going around. And then when it finally reaches the photomultiplier, it's in some position. Likewise, the second one, this is the first one. This, let's say this is the first surface, the second surface, but more correct when you put the timing in, that's the contribution of the first surface. Now, for the other way that the thing can happen, we have the second arrow turned also brrr, around a great deal, but not by the same angle. Let's just for a moment suppose that the two surfaces were exactly on top of each other, then the times would be exactly the same and the angles would be the same. And in that case, the other one would come out this way. But if it's further down, it in general will come out at some other angle because the time is not the same. So let's draw it at another angle. Now the rule is this, that if you can, if the general rule starts something like this. Probability is equal to the square of an amplitude. Amplitude for an event that can happen in more than one way is the sum of the amplitudes for each way. Now, what I mean by sum, how do you add two funny arrows? Rule for adding arrows, you put one on the tail of the other. So hit this was number one and this is number two. You draw them like that and see what you get left. So in this particular case, we have only two ways. We have only two arrows and I've added them together by making one chase the tail of the other. This is the arrow representing the contribution of the first surface and that's from the second surface, and you're all bored because I told you all that last time. <laughs> but hoping that there's a few more, some people, I cannot believe that everybody who was here before came again, and there's, a, <laughs> and there's the same number of people as there was before, so I deduce that there are some people <laughs> who weren't here before. Now, this, uh, this uh, then produces these effects in the following manner. That if the thickness is zero, the first arrow points this way for the case of zero thickness, say, and for zero thickness, the second arrow points that way, and if you put the, this tail on the head of the other one, you go up and back, and the net result is nothing whose circle is zero, and there's no probability. On the other hand, if you have a thickness, a little bitsy thickness, you got just a little bit more turn, and you get something. That's somewhere up, climbing up here. The best you can do is if you get the thickness just right so that the, this one is turned around so it's exactly lined up this way. So with a certain thickness that's just right, the first one is turned a certain angle and the second one, which would be out here, is turned more by another half turn. And therefore the second one is this way also. And when you put the tails together, you get it twice as long, right? And then you would have had it by one alone. And therefore, what is the probability? Four times that what it would have been for one alone. Because the probability is the size of the area of the circle, and for one alone, if there were only one surface, the circle is only so big, and it's twice the radius as four times the area of the circle. So therefore, the height of this is four times, should, the probability here should be four times as much as it is from one surface. And since from one surface it's 4%, and four times four is 16. <laughs> this has to have been 16. And it is. <laughs> now in this manner, of course, if we take greater thickness, the thing turns around further and further. And uh, it goes down again, gets back into the same condition in a repetitious fashion when the timings are so. And so we understand why this keeps on going up and down, up and down, up and down. I mean, I'm sorry, we don't understand a damn thing, but we have described how it behaves. 
You'll notice that the average here, if you didn't, you had some circumstance in which you could, you averaged this and didn't look too closely at the thicknesses. You had to be a regular plate or something like that. Well, for any other reason, one want to average it. The average is about halfway up, in fact, it turns out, because of the symmetry of the curve, to be exactly halfway up. And the average is 8%, which is the amount of light that you would get expected to have gotten if 4% came from the front and 4% came from the back and our life was easy. If it weren't for these bumps, there'd be nothing to that. We could understand 8% childishly, 4% from coming from the first surface and 4% coming from the second surface. But it doesn't do it that way. It sometimes gives us, instead of 8%, nothing. And other times it gives us 16%, which is more than we want. And it ends up, on the average, giving us 8%. And it gives a clue of how the old theories, the simple-minded views of what was happening, what happens in the world, why you can bounce balls and count things and do things, do things as you expect them to do, works. It happens that these irregularities involve this distance of thickness of something like thickness of glass of the general nature of 10 one millionth of an inch. And uh, therefore, for ordinary pieces of stuff with reasonable dimensions in which you're not so accurate as 10 one millionth of an inch, you're doing a lot of averaging. And then common sense dumb stuff like, look, it reflects 4% from the front surface and 4% from the back surface. It's got to reflect 8 come out right. But that's because you're averaging all this fancy business with these arrows. Now, uh, what I would like to do in this lecture uh, is to show you, a very, to start you off in a certain direction and to show how it is that although this model of the world is so thoroughly and utterly different than anything you've ever seen before or expect and hope never to see again, <laughs> It will explain the simple properties of light that you know. And uh, properties such as uh, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, that's in there. That uh, light goes in straight lines, that's in there. That light, when it goes from air to water, it deflects. The light goes in a certain line, you know, that, and when it goes, light goes from air to water, it, it, it changes direction. Yes, all that's in there. That if you, build a, if you have a lens, you can focus light to a point, and things like that. All of that's contained in this thing, plus many other phenomena. And the great difficulty I had with this lecture was this. It's so easy to derive all these phenomena that you take so long to learn about in school that uh, I did one after the other until I found I was doing too many. And then I realized I'm doing it to people who know that. For example, what is the exact behavior? How much does light go into a shadow? I wanted to explain. It's easy, but I'm not... But since not many people know how much it really, you know, how it looks, they haven't seen diffraction anywhere, I won't bother with that phenomenon. So what I had to do is to control myself and not produce a large number of examples, but only a few to show you how it starts. But I guarantee you, of course, because otherwise I would be, it would be illegitimate what I've been saying, that all this agrees exactly with every phenomenon that everybody has ever observed with light, every detail phenomenon, so I'm just going to start with the simplest possible ones that are common. All right? We start with a mirror. We start with the problem of determining how light is reflected from a mirror. And we have a, here a source of light, and here the photoelectric cell, which is, go I mean, a photomultiplier uh, that's going to measure very low intensity light. We have one photon at a time go here through here, and we would like to know what the chance is that this thing gives a count. It's also possible that the light goes straight across. To avoid that, we put a black bo box in here. So we have to think, and we would expect that what we'd have is that the light would reflect from the mirror like so. And that's what we usually say. And that all you need is this piece in the mirror here. And this got nothing to do with the price of cheese under these circumstances, right? And that, in fact, the place where it reflects is where the angles are equal. That might be obvious to you because it's so darn symmetrical. But if I put this thing further down, you can still prove the angles are equal, and I'll show why it is. By this rule, yes, sir. As follows. Rule. Probability that a thing occurs is a square of an amplitude. Amplitude is the sum of the amplitude for every way that the thing can happen. In that experiment, there were two ways it could happen. In this experiment, there's virtually an infinite number of ways it can happen. To make it easier to understand, suppose that this mirror surface was temporarily divided into little squares. It's best if the mind forgets for a while that there's another dimension to this mirror this way. This is a cross-section of the mirror. 
And just for the hell of it, I can forget that, but we can do it the other way too. Now what happens is that there's several ways in which the photon could have gone to the photomultiplier. It could have come down to this part of the mirror and bounced off and went to here. You're crazy. The angle ain't equal. I'm not crazy. That's what happened. <laughs> Another possibility is it could come here and go. Or it could come here and go. Or it could come where you'd like it to come and go. <laughs> and it can go over here and go. And so on and so on. And these are all possibilities. And the idea is that there's a certain amplitude that it does it this way, an amplitude that it does it that way, and so on. And now we have to figure out the total probability that it does it at all. Naturally, instinctively, you're gonna, you know, I'm going to tell you the rule that the amplitude is biggest for the one where the angles are equal. No, no. The amplitudes are, they're slight variations, which we're not going to worry about them. It's almost the same for this one as for that one. Let us take it easy. We make approximations here to make it easy to do, and I don't want to absolutely exactly mathematic. I just want to explain the idea. I'm going to suppose it's exactly the same amplitude for every one of these things. But the timing eh, is different. That is, let's suppose that the rule of ref that your chance that you get reflect the amplitude to be reflected in a in a little square here is some little arrow. Very small, I draw it. But because it, I have to count the total time to go from here to here to here, this arrow, the contribution of this one, gets rotated, zing, depends upon this time. And the one to go from here to here is also rotated, but not by the same amount. Because I think you can almost see that the distance from here to here is certainly not the same as the total distance from there to there. There's a time it would take. You don't. It's not obvious? All right, then let's take a place way over here. The time it would take to go over here and then go rushing off to here is certainly longer than it would take to go the easy way. And in fact, if you were in a hurry and you had to run over to this wall and run back, you'd know more or less that the best way to do it is somewhere in the middle there. <laughs> and it isn't a good idea to run to the wall here and then have to go back. <laughs> so what we're going to do here is to figure this out by a series of drawings to help us calculate the second drawing underneath here is a kind of a graph. I, let's see if I can do this with colors by some. I don't know how to do it with colors. I didn't figure it out ahead of time. But this is a graph in which I measure this way. Yeah, let's do it this way. The time that it would take to go from here to the mirror and over here. And I'm plotting it this way, directly under the place where I wanted to go in the mirror. You see? Now, the time it takes to go here, we just found out, was pretty large, and getting going down, more or less, as we got near the center, and of course, it's a kind of a symmetric curve, and it goes up here. What do I mean by this? Is this, at this, at this, let's make it very definite. If you're going to reflect from this point here, this particular route, then this is the amount of time. This height is a graph of the amount of time. There's a lot of time. If, on the other hand, colors, colors. If, on the other hand, you were to go somewhere near the middle and come down this way and go so, then the time it would take is less. And it's plotted on this scale as this height from here to here. You don't have to worry about the plot if you understand the idea. The time is big, comes down, and goes back up again. That's all, depending on where you are. And now what does that mean for our arrows? It means this. That the contribution from this one corresponds to an arrow like this, a little baby arrow. Baby because I made these things very tiny in the end. Uh, I told you in the last lecture that we have learned that students take four years of undergraduate work plus four years of graduate work to learn how to add these arrows cleverly and quickly. And we'll just do some simple examples. So I tell you what, we, we'll have to just work it out ourselves for one or two examples. But, that's all they learn is how to add the arrow. Now this, <laughs> what you do here is you take this arrow and you turn it around a lot, a lot, that's what I call a lot, from here to here, and you come out with the arrow in some direction because it's spun around and spun around at so much time. Now on the next point here, which I didn't draw in a color, but just let's talk about it, it's less time. It doesn't turn around as much. It's more like that, okay? The next one is less time. It doesn't turn around as much. 
I should be coming toward the green one case. And this time it's not, well, let's say, let's say this one's around here. And this one, you see, what I want to point out that, the, well, I didn't do it too well, but that the change is less each time as I go along. That this one is, I don't mean it that, it's an accident that it comes out nearly horizontal. I don't care where it came out, but unfortunately it's nearly horizontal. Let's say that the next one is hardly any change from this and corresponds perhaps to that direction. There's no meaning to the absolute fact that it happened to come out that way. But it's important to point out that as I go on to the other side, the timing is increasing again, and so the contribution, the arrow I would have to draw to correspond to the contribution from this would be again slightly inclined. As I went further over, the inclination would increase again further and further. If I do it very carefully, I should have at corresponding places out this side the same kind of arrows as on this side. In other words, the contribution that's made according to this dopey rule that to get the total amplitude that the thing arrives over there, the square is the probability. We have to add an amplitude for each root, and each amplitude is the same except that turns different degrees depending on the time. And now I have to add all these things together. Of course, it goes on and on on both sides in the mirror way out, and it's hard to get started because they're way over here. But let me just start over here or further back. What happens is I'm going to put the arrows on each other's tail. This one represents the first one here. And now this one comes. You see, I put the arrows on each other's tail. And then the next one. It isn't working out too. <laughs> it's hard to make the drawing clear, but maybe you'll believe me when I tell you what happens if you do it very carefully. And then it comes an arrow this way. And then the green one, which is hardly any difference in direction. And then the next pink one, that's just, just tilted up there a little bit again, and then tilted up some more, and then tilted up some more, and then tilted way back. And now let's, for the fun of it, keep on going. Yeah? But what will happen is the things that get turned more and more and turned more and more. So the next one's this way, and 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 the next one's this way. Okay, boom. And in the same way, the stuff that I hadn't drawn yet over there correspond to an arrow tilted still further cockeyed and still further cockeyed and so on, all knotted up in little things. Now that from one edge of the mirror, which is the last, the 74th arrow over there that I know, to the other edge of the mirror, which is a seven millionth actually arrow, because there's a, usually with a reasonably sized mirror, since these angles involved turns, involve millionths of an inch, there are millions of turns. So that this got down to really down in the middle here, and it goes to the middle here. And so that the total amplitude, which is the sum of all these arrows added together, of which last time I added two, I now add three, no, I add five, no, I add millions of them. I get a line for the net result of the whole thing, the total amplitude to arrive, which is this tremendous line from here to here, at the result of all those little arrows. Okay? Now, let's investigate. What determines how long that line is? That the size of that squared determines the probability. Now we notice a number of things. First, that the edges of the mirror are not important. That were I to have chopped a piece of the mirror off over here, a piece that you had intuition knows I was wasting my time piddling around with, it wouldn't make any difference. Because that part in there, the arrows are going <laughs> I throw it all away. I don't you said it doesn't make any difference because so I start a little bit off here a shade. It doesn't hardly make any difference. Therefore, I can really chop this mirror down a bit. Where is the part of the mirror that makes the real difference, that makes this get a real length, that makes it likely to be big? It's the place where the arrows are all pointing nearly in the same direction for a while. Think a while. It means it's the place where the curve stops changing for a while. And after much mental effort, you'll discover that's always the place where the time is least, or possibly of the way sometimes, most. Most often in practice it's least, but it can happen most. Any time the time curve stops changing, it's a place where the time is least. And so it turns out that the ray that's most important, the thing that determines the probability, is the part of the physical world which is close to the place where the time is least. 
And that's why you don't have to worry about the other part of the mirror. And that's why, crudely speaking, you say, hell with the rest of the mirror, I can just use a little piece. You're wrong if the piece gets too short. If it gets too short, you don't get much of these. You get a few of them and not enough. You get different answers. But that's a few, maybe thousandths of an inch, and you're not used to experiments with thousandths of an inch mirrors. Although in the laboratory, we have many such experiments, and I would am strongly tempted to tell you what happens with such things and so on, but that's not everybody's experience, and so I have to stop myself somewhere. And so I stop here. I say, what I've done is I've pointed out that only part that really counts to give you the answer there is what happens in the center of the mirror, that the other parts cancel themselves out in their effects. They're just as strong, there's just as big an arrow from here as there was from here. But you just move a little shade over and there's another big one trying to undo it because it's twisted. And uh, in the middle where the time is least, uh, the arrows for a while point in the same direction. That's why in approximation, we say you can get away with a crude picture of the world by saying the light just comes to the middle part where the time is least. And it's mathematically easy to prove and in any circumstance, when the time is least, it turns out it means those angles are equal. And I, again, I've attempted to prove that, but I won't bother you in straining your geometric imagination.